Hello there, thank you for joining me again today. Welcome to the wonderful world of RF and electronics engineering. On the bench for repair today is a HP Agilent 8594E Spectrum Analyzer. Um, if you haven't seen the Roden Swartz repair video I did, um, if you look at that one for the Roden Swartz Spectrum Analyzer repair, uh, this Spectrum Analyzer came from the same gentleman who's asked me to look at this one as well. has a very similar fault as well to the um, the Roden Swartz Spectrum Analyzer. And I think the same problem has occurred to this than perhaps what's happened to this, the Roden Swartz one where something's been fed here that's been an inappropriate level. But anyway, um, we'll come to that soon. Now this Spectrum Analyzer can have a tracking gen fitted and if it was, it would be installed here. We would have an output port. Um, so this one doesn't have a track gen fitted, but it does feature a wide frequency range of 9 kilohertz to 2.9 gigahertz. And um, what we'll do in a moment, we'll power it up and we'll just have a look to see what's what's wrong with it. Now, this instrument has been previously looked at by HP Agilent themselves. And on the top here, we've got a fault uh, information, which tells us there that... Uh, it won't calibrate it says uh, cal signal 20 db low uh, it says unable to calibrate and that was back in 2014 by agilent technologies um so obviously you know it's it's being looked at but uh, it just needs perhaps another look at to verify what the fault is because uh, the hp agilent uh, ticket on the top doesn't actually say uh, what it suspects to be faulty within the unit, what board or what module, so we'll, we'll need to look at that. Uh, we've got on the front here, we've got the volume control and the intensity knob, uh, the memory card slot, we've got the cal output which links over to this when we do the calibration, they, those two link together. Uh, we've got a, a socket for feeding power to a, a sensor probe or other accessories that connect in there for HP Agilent. We'll notice as well, when we look at the uh, RF connector on the front, it actually says uh, a DC level of 0 volts DC maximum and 1 watt maximum RF power, which is plus 30 dBm. And that's quite interesting because uh, it could be that DC bias has been fed up this. As I say, the gentleman who brought this to me was a radio amateur, has acquired this uh, spectrum analyzer. And... Um, it was the same chap who brought the Roden Swartz Spectrum Analyzer, the FACB 30 model Spectrum Analyzer for repair. And uh, unfortunately we couldn't repair that one due to the fact that Roden Swartz don't uh, give circuit diagrams in this particular service manual for that model of Spectrum Analyzer. It's, you know, return and repair only. Now, um, what we'll do, we'll have a look, see whether we can find a service manual for this as well. But before we do anything, we'll just turn it on and we'll see what uh, what happens. So we'll just let it boot up and do its thing. Um, so it's, it's coming up okay. And uh, as we can see there, the screen seems to be well balanced. There's no lines or fading or any dark spots on the screen or over luminance. So that's a that's good sign. Uh, so that's full brightness there. And that's backed off a little bit, about, I'd say, three quarters. Um, so what we can do, we can try and do a calibrate by linking these two ports together. Uh, we can have a look at that and we'll also um, see what happens there, what faults there are. I think there's a fault log in it as well, which I'll need to find. And, uh, and then we can have a look in a bit further to see if there's any fault codes stored and what they might be. And that might give us a bit of better indication of what's going on. And we'll link these ports together and try and run a calibrate routine. See whether that uh, shows any errors too. So bear with me. Okay, well we're joined by the technical manager. Who's uh, no doubt going to advise us at some stage. What the fault may be with this spectrum analyzer. Okay, so what we'll do now. We'll have a look at the uh, calibrate uh, function. See whether we can... We join these two together now, obviously, so that we can perform a calibration. Uh, we'll do calibrate frequency first before we do the amplitude bit, and we'll see what uh, what if anything it finds. 
now as yet it says uh, something about cal signal not found so it hasn't found the cal signal which is quite interesting even though it's uh, clearly there I mean obviously if I disconnect that then uh, hmm, that's strange isn't it very strange already the screen's a bit blurred I'll have to figure out how to uh, change the focus on the monitor because it's a bit blurred out cow signal not found center frequency zero hertz so it's obviously not found the 300 megahertz calibration signal then which is strange hmm very strange okay right I'll go back to Cal again reconnect that BNC and then we'll see we've got something there it's come back might be a bit, uh, a bit dirty is that signal maybe because it's, it does the other say that the center frequency is zero Hertz so this is the internally generated signal that we get with the HP Agilent spectrum analyzers uh, this is often seen um, as I've remarked in previous videos before about that so what we can do anyway is we can um, go back to the uh, calibrate menu uh, we'll just do a cal amplitude just to see whether that does anything and uh, we'll see what happens there yeah cal signal not found it says so it can't see the signal that comes out now this is a 300 megahertz uh, signal um, from what I understand um, so we'll need to look at that to find out uh, whether there's actually a calibrate signal coming out. Now we can actually try and do that. If I just preset the instrument um, and then we, because the cal signal is permanently present, uh, if we then select the frequency and we select uh, 300 megahertz, so 300 megahertz span one megahertz so we have a signal there let's just verify that by removing the cal so we've definitely got that there um so that's interesting right we'll go to markers and we'll look at the marker level it's at neg is that 49 db and neg 46 or neg 48 i can't make it out because it's blurred is a screen a bit blurred but uh I'm sure it's it's possibly round about neg 48 dBm. Um, so that's interesting. Might have to uh, look into that a bit further to see what the level should be. I would have thought it's. I think it says neg either neg 48 or neg 40 dBm. I could work it out by looking at the uh, level on the graticules, but. Uh, yeah, it looks like as if uh, we've got a frequency there and a level. The level though from the calibrator might be too low. We'll have to look at that to see what it should be. And then we can go from there. Um, but what I will do is I will also feed in a, an RS signal into here anyway, a known level from the um, Aeroflex um, signal generator just to see whether that level's reflected correctly there. So that's what we'll do next and I'll also find out what the level is that should be coming out of there. Okay well the technical managers just advised me that the uh, focus control is actually a little hole in the right hand side just here. So he's uh, selected this tool which is uh, insulated trimming tool and we're going to uh, try and adjust the focus now on that uh, on that screen. I think he's going to attempt to adjust it himself actually. Um, and that way then saves me a job right I'm adjusting the focus but I uh, can't seem to can't seem to get it absolutely uh, spot on don't seem to want to adjust much to tell you the truth I'm just looking at the text the lines and the uh, I'm just seeing that I can sharpen it up a bit making a bit of a difference there but not much really I'm just turning it gradually but it's uh, Pull clockwise now and then coming back again see whether we can get it 
it's fully counterclockwise so it's making absolutely no impact whatsoever on the uh, on the display but at least we can see it not too bad on the camera but to the naked eye it's a little sharper but some of the um, like the frequency some of these edge texts are a little bit blurred it's not particularly good but uh, right well we'll uh, we'll carry on now with the um the, there's a, a coarse adjust as well a coarse focus adjust it says uh, turn the analyzer line switch off remove instrument cover refer to blah blah remove procedure chapter three turn the percent of the focus adjustment adjustment locate just the course all right so that's a fine there's a course adjustment inside anyway once we whip the lid off um, another one on the monitor module so we might be able to sort that out and um, the technical manager is looking into it right now as we speak to find out exactly where that is so no doubt uh, we'll get some more advice right we'll just need to look at the calibrate level now what should be coming out of here and uh, and then we can measure it on the microwave test set using the um, scalar power probe and also we'll put a frequency in here on the end type um, so that the type n socket receives a signal at a particular frequency and level and check that verify it on there Okay, so what we're doing now is I'm feeding a signal in on the uh, Type N socket on the front of the instrument. Uh, we're using the um, uh, IFR signal generator, uh, which is here, to generate a signal at 500 megahertz at zero dBm. Uh, that, in accordance with uh, that measurement, should now show us 500 megahertz frequency, which it clearly isn't because 500 megahertz is the dead center dotted line and the waveform is showing to the right which means it's uh, measuring a higher frequency than 500 megahertz so it looks like the internal frequency standard probably off adjustment which is something we can adjust um, so we can move this back into the center however for the marker we'll need to introduce for the level just to get that to the peak there just to see whether that reads 0 dBm and it obviously doesn't now uh, we can do obviously peak search so it bangs it on the on the peak that we can just span zero uh, hertz and then we can then adjust the frequency uh, one way or the other let's have a look i think it's this way just find the peak as soon as it wouldn't lock onto it just then probably because it's out of adjustment so i think the peak's about there on zero span so we're looking at uh, minus I think that's 18 dBm in the top right hand corner because the focus is off it's difficult to see the eights the difference between the the eights and the zeros as you can see there you know that does look like an eight to me though 18.0 uh, something or other that's why it's important sometimes to get the bloody screen looking right before you start going any further because the trouble is is that uh, when the screen's off you can't see the detail in the measurements so but anyway at least we've uh, we know that's the peak there the signal so if we've got a 0 dBm coming in we've got an 18 dB loss uh, coming into there um, so there's a couple of things really the, free, the um, monitors out of focus the um, calibrate it couldn't see neither the frequency nor the level but because the internal reference has wandered off so we'll need to pull that back to spec and then thirdly there's the um, signal level discrepancy coming in which is uh, measuring 18 dBs away from where it should be so there's a few things to be going on with there uh, next thing we're going to do now we're using the microwave test set uh, which I'm just about to set up the Marconi MTS in, in conjunction with the breakout screen there uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cal signal level coming out of the uh, the port here the bnc jack to see what level it is now obviously that's got to be bang on uh, the cal frequency as well as the cal level so that the spectrum analyzer can calibrate itself to that so that's why we're going to use the accurate uh, mts now just to look at that and uh, we'll have a look to see what the frequency accuracy is as well coming out of this right just bear with me okay 
uh, rather than use a fancy microwave radio test set over here uh, like we were looking at earlier I decided change my mind I decided we'd use some separates today because using fancy all singing or dancing instruments often detracts from um, you know people that have uh, separate instruments now to set them up and, and use them in conjunction with such measurements so rather than go to the uh, the all singing all dancing uh, full Monty test e equipment we'll, we'll use the separates today so we've got a Marconi instruments uh, frequency counter which goes up to 26.5 gigahertz um, we're going to use the B input because 300 megahertz at minus 10 dBm is what emanates from this BNC so we're going to select uh, B on there and then it'll display the calibrate frequency now it should be 300 megahertz spot on now before you do any frequency measurement this is a calibrated um, Marconi frequency counter and it's on its own internal standard at the moment which has been calibrated to but the thing is is that with these you meant to leave them switched on for at least half an hour for the crystal oven to warm up for the frequency stability of the frequency counter to settle before you take any measurements so we've had this on for 30 minutes just sat on top of this um, spectrum analyzer just warming up and obviously then it's reached its peak operating temperature now it's stable um, normally they reach the stability quite quick but I have a general rule of thumb which is just leave them alone for a good half an hour to an hour maybe uh, obviously if you're on a workbench situation you have all this stuff powered up anyway from the moment that you turn all your bench on and begin work but in my case I have these instruments on shelves and when I need them I get them off a shelf and then obviously put them on the bench and that's why we need that warm up time and that's the same with any test instrument it doesn't matter what it is you know you need to leave it alone for a good half hour now we're going to measure the level shortly using another Marconi instrument separate uh, with a, a power probe um, so we'll look at the level coming out but first of all we'll just concentrate on the frequency obviously if the frequency is off which it is here it's reading not 300 megahertz it's slightly off frequency it looks around about 30 something kilohertz of frequency there but um, inside the spectrum analyzer there's an adjustment pot and then there's a fine adjustment electronically through the calibrate menu with the DAC setting so you can change the digital to analog conversion um, DAC levels so that basically it will fine tune the frequency of the uh, of the of the standard or alternatively you can just adjust it in the crystal oven uh, which is within the uh, spectrum analyzer which when we get the lid off we'll see that so what I'm going to do to find out the actual correct uh, frequency offset that it's currently at at the moment the calibrate signal if I press set button and then type in 300 and then set again that should tell us then that because we set the frequency counter to a reference frequency of 300 megahertz it will now display what the frequency error is which in this case is 35.818 kilohertz minus minus so the frequency is lower than 300 megahertz obviously because it was 299 megahertz so this is very uh, very accurate frequency counter um, so we're going to need to adjust this 35 kilohertz down to zero as near as damn it zeros so that therefore this reflects the um, the accuracy of the spectrum analyzer so now that I know it's off frequency by 35 kilohertz I can make a mental note of that and now we'll then go on to the Marconi um, RF power meter now using an RF power probe we'll calibrate the power probe and then we'll connect it directly here so it's measuring the RF straight from the BNC on the front of the uh, spectrum analyzer directly at that port um, and that way then it gives us a truly accurate measurement because these um, scalar probes are very well not scale in this case it's an RF power probe but that's that's the RF power probe that we're going to be using and that measures power directly at the socket whereas if we're using um, you know RF cables and such like that are lossy then the um, the loss is uh, is obviously great in the cable obviously so this is highly accurate I'm sort of talking a 0.1 dB accuracy so it's extremely 
uh, important to calibration that we use things like these probes in order to measure directly at the port. So bear with me, we'll just set up the Marconi power meter now to read the RF power. Okay, now we've set up the uh, RF Marconi power meter, uh, which is using the um, power probe here. So we're going to calibrate that now before we make our measurement and, uh, and just ensure that the um, measurement is going to be accurate by calibrating the probe. So first thing we do is we, we get the probe and we connect it to the end type on the front of the instrument. Uh, then what we do, if I remember rightly, because it's been a while since I've used this instrument after this setup, uh, we then go to AutoCal and now it's going to calibrate that probe against its own internal reference. And uh, then we've got uh, it says under range, I don't know why that is, uh, limits, oh there we are, limits, there we are, it says 1.2 milliwatts, so it's been calibrated there, uh, dB level, I think it is, so will it display DBs, uh, or units, oh hang on, I'm making a mess of this, uh, oh dear, what have I done, I've done something wrong, auto, right, uh, how do you do that now? That DBM, here we are, look. And then uh, auto. Auto. Enter. That's it. Uh, DB relative. Range. Oh, there we are, look. Range. Uh, under range, HD5. I was hoping that it had, uh, oh, I know what's going wrong here, let's have a look, do, 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 do. oh, is it 1, HD1, range, HD2, HD3, HD4, HD6, will it, no, 5, unit star, O2 oh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here, I'm doing something wrong uh, There's cow factors, there's a range, average Average 1 Why is it saying it's under range? No, oh, that's why, like an idiot I've not selected the uh, power adder so it weren't going to measure anything was it? I'm an idiot. Uh, anyway, at least you can see what mistakes, honest mistakes. Still says under range though. I don't know why that is. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Oh, it's, now it's over range. Can't make his mind up. It's either over range or under range, isn't it? Oh, here we are. Look, my word. So setting range three, then the level's correct. We've got the meter reading here and we're reading 0 dBm which is a reference signal coming out of here so I'll switch the reference power off now now that we've figured all that fiasco out now we can uh, move over to actually making a measurement directly from the front of the spectrum analyzer and after a thousand turns of the uh, the end type then we can get that off so right now I just need the adapter from this cable here uh, so we'll unscrew that and we'll get the power probe connector we're using the enter type enter bnc adapter and now we will connect that to what is the front of the test instrument so we'll remove the cable that's going to the frequency counter get that out of the way place this probe now on the front of the instrument and uh, we're getting a level reading now on our trusty Marconi level meter which reads uh, minus 17 point call it 9 dBm or 8889 dBm so it does say it's under range so let's see whether we can 
I thought that might be auto range. There probably is, but I can't remember how you get that to work now. HD to where we are, so that's in its measurable range now. Um, so it's reading minus seventeen point eight three dBm. That's its accurate measurement of the signal. So that obviously should be reading minus ten. So it's seven point eight dBm off level. So that'll need adjusting as well. So I think the first thing we need to do then um, is to uh, whip the lid off this uh, Agilent spectrum analyzer and let's set up the frequency accuracy first followed by the um, the amplitude now it does mention here in the service manual something about um, oh, I'm not sure it mentioned something in there that I read earlier in an earlier section about uh, being able to set the frequency accuracy up first before the level if I remember rightly not the other way around so that's what we'll do we'll get the lid off and we'll, uh, we'll we'll set that up first then we'll look at the level calibration and see what we can do about that and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get the calibrate working and take it from there okay so we've got the lid off it now and uh, we're having a a bit of a look inside where all the magic happens and um, I think that one of the first things that we need to do is to uh, get the damn focus thing sorted out and uh, I think it's uh, one of these two controls down there which sorts out the course focus and uh, we'll need to get in there and adjust those potentiometers I think in order to uh, Get the focus sorted out but basically we've got the um the, the composition it's quite a heavy instrument it's a devil to move about on the bench but uh, basically top and bottom of it is uh we have the step attenuator module there um I don't know if you can see down there it's quite a long module it goes from top to bottom of the test set so that's where the rf input from the front connector connects through into there and then the step attenuator is controlled via this uh, ribbon cable which connects to the microprocessor board which is all of this board that runs across the side of the instrument uh, we've then got the converter uh, we've got all the bandpass filters um, also in the conversion side of things bandwidth filter uh, we've also got a third converter here and then we've got a log amplifier um, I think this is an option card that's been installed here for some kind of fitted option and then at the top here we've got the power supply these are nightmares to fix there I've got other videos on repairing these and I've also got a, a real nasty fault one uh, in the repair pile which I've ordered parts for which has come now so I'll be doing a video on that soon on uh, on servicing these and trying to get to the bottom of that uh, the monitor module itself has got adjusters for horizontal and vertical um, adjustments as well as focus control um, all the usual analog monitor adjustments that you normally get with that kind of uh, module so I think what we'll do we'll just first of all get the focus adjusted because that's something that's been annoying me um, so we'll whip it round and uh, we'll just see whether we can power it back up again and see whether we can uh, just adjust the the focus hopefully we can get a decent picture out of it let's have a look so I might be able to focus on that text so we'll get our trimming tool and we'll just uh, See whether we can get in there and make any adjustments. Let's see what uh, that alters the field scan. Let's see if we can adjust it.
just see if I can get in there a bit. These potentiometers are the ones with the uh, hexagonal uh, adjusters in them, from what I understand. These have got like little hexagonals inside, which you can probably just see inside there. So they just need the uh, hexagonal trimming tool, and I'm using one with a, a flat edge, so that's no good. Right, we've got some trimming tools here. Um, that looks like it might do the job. It's got a bit of a, it's got a hexagonal on it. Um, just looking now to see what else we've got. Uh, these trimming tools are always a pain in the backside. Let's have a look. Mm, there's some in there. In there, mm, that might do it because it's got a big enough hole. Oh, yes, very nice, very nice. Yes, I think that'll do the job nicely, even though it's a flat blade. I've got an hexagonal one here that's got like a hexagon as well as a flat, but the hexagon's too large for the hexagon that's in the uh, potentiometer, so that's about as much use as a chocolate fire guard. And um, in this little box here, these are Philips tuners for TVs, old analog TVs from yesteryear. But I can't see anything that would... There might be one or two in there that might do the job, but I think I'll be struggling, to be honest with you. I'll, I need to work with what I've got. So, right, we'll just turn this round now then. Back to where we were. Exercise and caution, of course because it is turned on and uh, now we can adjust the screen again back to where it should be so let's let's see where we go with it so right so let's just adjust that screen back up to where it should be it's about there which is nice the next one I believe is the focus or it might not be all depends how you look at it and that's a bit dodgy isn't it let's have a look here it's always a pain to adjust these things I don't, I don't understand why things need to be so difficult to adjust Let me try that trimming tool that I had earlier, that uh, hexagonal one, which I've got here, yeah, let's try that one then, so let's see if this makes any difference, this will be here all day at this rate, just for the sake, why don't we just use a standard potentiometer, one that's got a, again, all this fancy, right. That's not too bad, let's just set the geometry up a bit further. Oh no, here we go. Can't adjust that anymore. Back to that. Not having much success here with these damn trimming tools. Let's get them all out again, faff about some more. There's a possibility that might do it. We'll see. Have a look. Oh yeah. That'll do that bit. Right. Okay, where's the next one then? There's some potentiometers that are used in this that are uh, just standard potentiometers. Mm, no, it doesn't like that, does it? Let's see what I can get back on. Trying to uh, find the location. Hole. Let's 
そのままNot having much progress here. Let's have a look at the service manual. What does the service manual say? I'm sure it was one of those two that was meant to be. Trouble is, you see, with them having those difficult um, potentiometers, you know, it's a pain in the backside again. The usual thing HP. Let's make it difficult, you know, instead of just having a potentiometer that has a little screwdriver slot in it, you know, to make it easy for everybody so they can just adjust things without having all this faffing about. Usual thing. So let's find the section back in the service manual that talks about the focus control um, for the thing. Let's have a look. Do, 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 do. Uh, see if we can find it again in the manual adjustment procedure oh dear things never go to plan do they you've always got to faff about let's have a look here see what we can see oh sampler display here we are look top access course focus adjustment so I was in the right location to start with, but uh, it's not actually, the monitor's a slightly different design though on this one, so it may not be that, let's just have a look, see what I can find. Just having a look to see what we can do. Oh, that's the brightness. So, that's maximum. Right. So that control sets the the brightness. When we add that at maximum, and you can overdrive it quite easily and obviously bring it down a bit so that's that one next one and that makes it go all a bit a bit funny one way and that's the other uh, let's have a look here see what if that's any of these doesn't seem to make any difference that one what's this one do nothing have a look at this one back to the original location where we're at now I think uh, that pot doesn't seem to want to turn for some reason. It's like it's stuck. Oh, what about this potentiometer? That one, see that one turns. That one's okay. You know, it's a bit funny, a bit jerky. Hmm, strange. This one though, I don't want to play ball. And that's the one that says, well, it just basically says uh, that's the course adjustment. So, I don't know, it seems a bit strange, does that one? Uh, maybe the larger tool will go into that one. Oh, yes, that's adjusting now. But that ain't the focus. That is definitely not the focus. 
so I have no idea where the service manual you see the service manual is the 8591 this is a 94 this is the only manual I could get so it potentially could be the wrong monitor or an older monitor or a newer one whichever um, but I got some potentiometers in these two holes another potentiometer down here which may have something to do with moving it horizontally yes that does that this potentiometer sorts the brightness out again synergy with this full brightness minimum brightness uh, back to this one just all quivers it a bit it's just a time base I think adjustment that which is fine and then there's this one up here that could be the focus one so let's just have a look see what it says there I'm just going to have a look to see whether there's a potentiometer there and there is right down in the bottom Right, so I might be able to get my trimming tool, which I can just see down the. Uh, I can just see down the hole. Got the uh, trimmer right the way down there. It's along with each one. So we've got it in the hole and the potentiometer. Now we can turn this back round. Do then. Oh, that's it. Now that's better. See, that's a lot better there. If we wind it up too much, it then goes blurred, which is where it was before. So if we leave it there, it sort of. Hmm, that's a lot better, I think. Now, on brightness, why the brightness? It's a full brightness. So let's go back to this other potentiometer that I think was this one, and then adjust that. Oh, and I can get the uh, thing to go in the in the hole. Right, so that's again if we maximum brightness, but. Tweak it down a bit. Yes, that's better. I think that's better. You see, we, the text is, is nice and sharp now. And uh, it's not as distorted, I don't think. I don't know if you agree with that, but the... Uh, the text is more clearer. Um, I mean, I'm focused in right there, maximum, but it certainly seems more sharper to me anyway at this stage. So I'm quite happy to leave it at that. Obviously, for brightness as well, too much you get that, but I'll wind it down a bit. It's, there's like a, a bit of there's quite a bit of burning on this tube as well, and. Uh, so I have to bear that in mind, I mean obviously you can't have perfection, but uh, I'm just going to go to the fine uh, focus control now, which is on the side here, I believe. Let's have a look. Uh, it's one of these down there. So we'll have a look at that as well and see whether this trimming tool adjusts the fine one. I've just got to get the right, there we go, focus. Right, so this is the fine focus control. But again, it, it, it go all the way around and it's, it's not really making a difference. I'd say the fine focus control is not really doing anything from what I can see of it anyway. I mean, I could be wrong, but... Obviously, your eyes might be better than mine, but I can't make that any better focus than we, we already were. So, I think uh, 
it's not really doing anything so I think we've reached the peak of what we can do there with that so I'm happy with the monitor so far because it, it's a lot clearer than it was um, <coughs> so I don't think we can get that improved anymore it's a lot better than it was to start with you know the text is more crisp sharper defined the lines are better as well and the luminance is, is better in my view so maybe it's placebo so we'll see we'll, uh, we'll move on now to the uh, calibrate levels and frequency okay so we're on the underside of the instrument now and according to the uh, diagram um, it shows the 10 meg reference oscillator to be here in this area um, so it's like reverse so this would be where the speaker grill is if it had the speaker option which is this grill here then with the option board uh, that the YIG I believe oscillator so we've got this uh, what appears to be a frequency adjust it says there um, but there ain't no frequency adjust on this one so it looks like it's done through software through the calibrate if I just carefully turn it over a little bit you can just see there that uh, there's the reference oscillator module down there but there's no signs of any uh, adjustment potentiometers or anything like that so it must be adjusted through the software the calibrate screen now the calibrate screen is password protected it's got some kind of passcode that you need to enter in order to get into the service call menu so I need to find that out now in order to unlock it so that I can make the adjustments through the software according to the um, service manual uh, you can either adjust it manually using this uh, frequency adjustment uh, potentiometer this um, hole there which isn't on this particular model uh, but then of course it talks about um, adjusting the frequency manually um, by going into the cal and um, changing it there there's some more information here about it 10 megahertz reference option 4 um, do, 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 do. so it talks about going into the um, menu so we'll have to look at that because I think uh, when you go into the menu on the front of the instrument if I uh, remember rightly press cal um, then it was I believe we got uh, cal frequency cal amplitude cal stir oh that was it it was one of two of four and then it was service cal there we are look service cal a service cal and then we've got um cal time base so attenuator error uh execute type of flatness uh, the time cal time base i'm not sure if it was cal time base but then it wants the uh, passcode needed, you know. So we just make sure that uh, there's two of them are CRT horizontal vertical cal fetch service cal service diagnostic default cal track gen, which ain't on this one. So yeah, the time base, which is under service cal, cal frequency and amplitude. But there again, that's trying to run the yeah the diagnostics. So uh, I think looking at it, it's probably going to be software unlock now in order to uh, unlock the service menu. Then obviously adjust the frequency so I just need to find out how to do that 
Okay, to access the uh, calibrate in the service manual, it, uh, it talks about uh, using uh, a frequency, <coughs> excuse me, as a prerequisite, uh, minus 2001 uh, megahertz. And then uh, go into the service cal and then select the time base. Now, when we do that, then a DAC number will appear on the screen and we can adjust that accordingly to then calibrate the frequency. So, we'll just uh, look at that now then. So what we'll do, uh, we will enter in a frequency in here. Um, so we'll preset the instrument first, just from where we were in the previous state. Now, it doesn't say hertz, it megahertz, that's it. So, uh, we'll do frequency uh, to, oh, I've already messed it up already. Minus two zero zero one uh, megahertz. Okay. We'll then go to Cal. Uh, then go to do, 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 service Cal. Then we'll go to Cal time base, which is this one. It says passcode needed. Uh, is it hertz? Let's have a look. I wonder if it's that then. Let's have a look. Because um, somebody's made a manual note on this. Copy the service manual saying Hertz. Minus 33. Enter. Hmm. Let's just try that then. So. Da, 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 frequency minus 20. Frequency minus two zero zero one hertz. Cal three page three of four service cal, and then cal time base. There we are. So although the service manual is reference to megahertz, it's not actually the megahertz key at all. It's uh, hertz key. So entering minus two zero zero one hertz. Although there is a, a manual reference here to uh, another code as well, which we might have to look at. But it basically says, uh, enter that frequency first, then press the cal button, more page one or three, two or three, then service cal, then cal time base. But that megahertz is hertz actually. And then we've got a DAC number, and then uh, which controls the frequency. So the DAC itself is uh, set to 150. So if I come back out now and we connect our trusty, um, oh, I just need a longer lead because the lead I've got for the frequency counter is not long enough to reach. So I'll just put a longer lead on, but uh, just interestingly enough, I'm just wondering if we can adjust that uh, DAC by rotating the control, and you can. So all right, so that uh, should be easy to do. Right, I'll just get a cable that's long enough to uh, connect between both, then we'll carry on. So, back to the instructions. 10 megahertz reference standard uh, within the unit. Um, the internal 10 megahertz time base is just for frequency accuracy, so it does not adjust a long term drift. Blah blah blah. The time base is adjusted for a frequency of 300 megahertz as read by the frequency counter. So it then talks about the test setup there, which is we've got the cal output from the instrument into a frequency counter. And then talking about 10 hertz roughly to 500 megahertz range there. Yeah, it talks about a spec. We put this code in. Uh, we've now got a DAC displayed on the screen and then it says a number displayed in the active function block of spectrum analyzer display this setting is DAC 0 to 255 which controls the frequency of the internal time base use the number of keyboard to change the DAC setting until the frequency counter reads 300 megahertz plus or minus 75 hertz plus or minus 0.25 parts per million once the time base has been adjusted for minimum sideways movement, press CAL STORE. The new DAC number will be stored in non-volatile memory. 
Um, so then it talks about option 4 which is a TCXO that's got its own thing here time base in out connector disconnect the jumper between the 10 megahertz reference output connect a BNC cable between that adjustment procedure and that one then talks about select gate time select frequency 10 megahertz by pressing this the frequency counter should display the frequency locate the frequency just control which this one doesn't have because it's not got option 4 so that's irrelevant because that then talks about that little fine tune thing there so basically we're back to where we were uh, here which is the 10 megahertz standard so I'm following that now so what I've done I've connected the frequency counter up we have the um, frequency reading there at 299 point whatever it is um, now as I adjust uh, the rotary control onto the spectrum analyzer um, let me see if I can get a better picture for everybody let's have a look um, do, 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 do. If I can go there, right. Can't win, can you? Right. We've got the DAC value displayed here. Now, when I turn the rotary control on the display, that should be adjusting its frequency. So, I would want to see wild discrepancies in frequency change there. And we're going right the way down now to zero DAC because its range is only zero to two five five. And as you can see, the frequency is actually um, not moving; it's staying where it is. Uh, likewise, we're now climbing the DAC towards a two five five mark, and we're not even getting you know tens of hertz in resolution change. So again we're climbing up now to nearly the two that's 255 can't go any further now than 255 so making this adjustment isn't actually adjusting anything on the time base it's not doing that so that's a disappointment looks like as if there's obviously a fault in the time base circuitry um something of that ilk so might need to look at that further Known frequency. St I'm just reading a bit here in the manual about uh, about that the crystal and LC bandwidth filter circuits correction constraints. Talking about various things, crystal adjustment, things like that, and symmetry. But it doesn't give any information as uh, you know as to uh, what to do if that's not adjusting. Apart from you know. I'm just now going to have to look in the rest of the service manual to find out if there's a circuit diagram and we can check to see whether the um, maybe the Veractor diodes that are in the temperature control crystal oscillator on the 10 meg reference board is actually changing uh, if the voltage is moving in synergy with the digital or analog level settings that are coming from the control board there'll be a a tune voltage that will move up and down in synergy with the DAC as we adjust this control so I need to perhaps look there to, if that information is available obviously it might not be but uh, let's just see what we can find with that so yeah I'm a little bit upset about that I was hoping that it would be uh, be working but anyway uh, we'll, we'll set the frequency just to 300 megahertz and it's 35.419 I've turned this on its side now so we can have a look at the uh, potentiometers that are inside for the level which I'm going to do next anyway but as you can see there as I adjust the rotary control it's you know the, the DAC's zipping up and down but uh, the frequency offset is still at 35.4 kilohertz and as I adjust that to minimum now zero DAC it's 35.40, 5.406 um, kilohertz of frequency and now I'm zooming right the way up to 255 which I'm at now and it's not shifted so there's no DAC control of the um, 
of the um, frequency so obviously that tells us that you know that little board on the underside isn't tuning now if we have a look here uh, all the power supply lines appear to be up as indicated by the LED so we've no loss of supply lines but down here we've got um, for the amplitude for the calibrator a cal out adjust potentiometer um, so this is the cal out coax um, which is this which leads off to the BNC um, so interesting interesting let's have a look filter adjust so what I'll do because we've now established that we can't adjust the frequency of the um, of the 10 meg oscillator that, that obviously derives the 300 meg time base uh, for the calibrator I think what we'll do we'll just hook up the um, the Marconi um, level meter now and we'll make that adjustment on the um, calibrator output, the RF level output. Um, so we'll do that. So it's reading minus 18 point uh, whatever dBm for the reference level. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, adjust this uh, calibrator thing. So let's see whether we can adjust that to minus 10. DBM. Well, that's getting worse when I turn it. Now it's gone under range, obviously, because it's gone above 19 dBm. Minus 19 dBm. Let's see whether I get this down to minus 10. So I'm just turning it clockwise. Now it's fully clockwise, and it will only go down at fully clockwise to minus 17 dBm, which is not ideal. Obviously, it needs to be minus 10, and I can't get any more adjustment out of it. Um, so, you know, obviously that's an issue. Um, so there's something majorly wrong uh, with both the level and also the data. Now, if I turn it counterclockwise, obviously we're getting to minus 20 dBm and beyond. It's a slow adjustment, but uh, fully clockwise now, then we can't get anywhere near minus 10 dBm. So. Obviously there's an amplitude issue as well as a frequency error issue. So with the DAC, could it be a supply issue potentially? That's why the supply voltages is low. I mean I would have thought we'd get one, maybe not the other. So for example, the amplification of the frequency would be okay and others would be to adjust the level. However, we might not have the frequency accuracy because the rat tuning diodes in the uh, temperature control crystal oscillator might be uh, failed or it could be that there's a digital logic fault where the microprocessor is changing the DAP values through an op amp, a digital analog converter and then obviously varying a voltage, a tuning voltage to the TCXO module. I could understand that not working but then I, I would expect to see the amplitude there which we haven't got but for both faults to be present that seems a little strange, a little strange. Okay, well, I mean, obviously, if I feed an RF signal in on the Type N connector there from the signal generator, uh, if this has been calibrated to a reference that was off to start with, then potentially it will read incorrect anyway. If it's gone through that cal sequence and the level's been too low and it's obviously... Uh, not read the right level and frequency it may have been wandered off and so there may not be a problem with the input it might just be down to the calibrator so I now need to dig further in the service manual to find out whether the there is a diagram for the calibrator uh, frequency um, board uh, and we'll have a look at that a bit closer might take it off the, the module at the back uh, and just see whether we can look at that a bit further this um, module, um, not sure whether there'll be any diagrams on that, but definitely uh, there might be some test procedures around that. But um, it could be that there's an issue with that as well. 
Um, so we'll just need to do a little bit further reading I think before we go any further. Okay I've re removed the uh, reference oscillator that was uh, attached up here. Um, I've noticed though we've got a bit of uh, possibility here. We've actually got a, uh, a trimmer capacitor down there. I don't know if you can see it. But just that in that hole there and it's obviously not accessible through the chassis from above but it is there so some hope yet that might be able to get this onto frequency uh, the tantalums don't look like as if they're burning or smouldering but I might measure those to see whether they're uh, going up the spout but again this uh, I would have thought though because there's only three wires connecting I would have thought, I mean it could be that there's a tune volt line, a positive and a negative supply than a tune volt line for uh, some kind of coarse tuning of the um, oscillator which will probably be a line that goes directly into the, the module itself but um, yeah so it's probably likely that there could be a tune line a positive and a negative supply that's the RF signal out, which obviously is an SMB connector, which then goes off to the front socket, I believe, calibrator. Uh, sorry, the module inside for uh, setting up the calibration signal. So we can adjust that to uh, perhaps get it on frequency. Being careful, of course, not to uh, short it out on anything. And, uh, you know, we've got a connector up here that's flapping in the breeze as well this thing I have no idea what that's for I just found that just floating around might need to look at see what that needs to plug in I think that's probably for the speaker because there's normally a loud speaker in this area for when the spectrum analyzers have got the option to demodulate AM and FM content so that's probably just for the speaker on news but yeah um, I'm going to make an adjustment on this now see whether we can get the frequency on yeah, one of the other possibilities as well that uh, I was looking at is that uh, with the service manual giving reference to an adjustment being made from this side and it being fitted like that, I had thought that perhaps when Agilent had a go at it, if a rush to put it back together, they put the module in the wrong way around and it should be this way. So obviously it would be in synergy with the service manual showing an adjustment from the, the bottom of the instrument. But I can clearly see that the cables, although they are cable tied here, um, I'm not sure whether the module would be sort of in that way, if you see where I'm coming from. Um, where it would be bolted like that and then you can adjust it from underneath. But the cables don't seem to reach, so I think it, it is meant to be in that way as well. But I'm not sure, you know, it may be that the guy will look to it at... Because uh, there's plenty of cable here, uh, and perhaps that's where it was meant to be mounted. Although the pillars underneath seem to indicate that it could be potentially mounted that way uh, because they would line up or would they no they wouldn't so hmm interesting um, so yes I think it is meant to be that way around but you know again the service man's a bit misleading because it seems to indicate there's an adjustment from the bottom of the instrument when it doesn't say having to remove a module flip it over and then make an adjustment so I did wonder whether somebody had been messing with it already, which I think is the case anyway, but uh, obviously I just may have had a look inside. But I don't think they'd have put anything back in correctly. I very much doubt it, they'd be experienced. So, yeah, interesting. So we'll give it an adjustment. Okay, yeah, uh, we've now got it connected up to the frequency count. It's powered on. I'm just being careful to make sure that the board doesn't move. And we'll just uh, try and adjust the... Um, trimmer capacitor in this board um, so yes uh, let's see whether we can go straight on it I don't seem to be able to adjust anything can't feel it biting so let's have a look no, no wonder the uh, the ends dropped out look there's one in that end but there's one in that end all oh, right well, let's see if I can find another here we are Yes, that's got an end in it, thank goodness. Right, uh, RF trimming tools as well, normally they're quite good quality uh, trimming tools, but uh, anyway. Right, I'll just get my arm out of the way so we can see what's uh, what's going off. We'll just twiddle it, tune for maximum smoke, see whether we can 
at the frequency to move but it ain't it ain't moving so I might go on to the output uh, on the SMB there to check to see whether the frequency is moving but the the uh, I'm turning the capacitor the capacitor's turning oh, can you believe it that's dropped out now look the, the end of that started to come out the the side of the trimming tool you can't win can you it's two sometimes these uh, trimmers are quite stiff to turn and they can break the the trimming tool if you're not careful so it's just one of those things I'm afraid but uh, let's see whether this can get on it yeah I think, it, I think it's adjusting it although sometimes no it's not moving the frequency really only very slightly by tens of hertz if that yeah but that's probably natural drift anyway. Right, I think I'm going to get an SMB BNC straight onto that uh, RF connector and see whether this thing is changing its frequency. Because if it is, it's the uh, multiplier that comes after this. Or the um, cal generator that's uh, got a fault on it. Because I just need to make sure that's coming out with a, a 10 meg signal. So... But as you can see, I've adjusted the capacitor and it's, it's not moving on the frequency counter. So, we'll uh, have to measure directly from the module now. Right, well, we're, uh, we're on now the SMB on the end of the thing into the port A, which is the um, 10 hertz, 200 megahertz input. We're measuring 10 megahertz coming out, give or take uh, about 211 hertz with the look of it, or 21 hertz rather. Uh, so I'm just going to make a minor adjustment on that capacitor to see whether we can actually get the uh, the frequency to 10 megahertz so I'll set I'll put uh, set uh, 10 megahertz 1 0 you know 10 megahertz 1 0 1 what is it with this damn set one I never even pressed that one zero right so it's 211 Hertz is that 2.2 yeah it's 211 Hertz um, off frequency or uh, 0.212 kilohertz so let's adjust that then now so that it reads um, I can just get the careful not to let that touch any circuitry obviously right so let me see if I can adjust this if we can get that trimmer capacitor to move let's have a look so that's working you see I mean we can go beyond now minus for quite a significant way um, so let's bring it back hmm just gradually adjusting it that's like 7 hertz off frequency now so and I think under here um, hmm where is it now So let's have a look. Um, hmm. Do you know? <sighs> Sometimes it makes me wonder. Right, set. Reset. Switch it off and back on again because it drives me up the wall this frequency counter. It's okay when you're uh, using it all the time, but when you're not using it a lot, it's a lot of faffing about. So let's have a look at this in hertz. That's kilohertz. That's hertz. So. That's as near as damn it. I don't think I'm going to get any better than that, so what? You never know though, do you? 
Let's see if we can just gradually alter it. But the main point of this is that we, we, we can see that we can make a change to the frequency. And that's down to 2 hertz, 1 hertz. Off frequency, 1 or 2 hertz. I'm not going to get it better than that without it jumping way off. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that, that, that module is definitely outputting 10 megahertz. So obviously... Um, there's an oscillator within the instrument, the uh, HP Agilent uh, Spectrum Analyzer, that uses a 10 meg reference from this then in order to stabilise the 300 meg reference signal. So there'll be sort of a phase lock loop um, oscillator that's running with a synthesizer that um, uses a 10 meg reference to keep the 300 megahertz on frequency. And obviously in this case the 300 megahertz signal isn't both the amplitudes failed as well as the frequency and the fact that the calibrator output is wrong frequency and level wise it's not down to this 10 megahertz oscillator obviously um, because if we can't adjust it now what I will do I'm just going to see if I can go into the calibrate menu which was where we selected uh, calibrate I just want to check that the fine adjust works Although it may not adjust the 10 meg reference oscillator, it might be, uh, but we'll, we'll have a look, we'll see, we'll see. So, if I press cal, oh, frequency, it was minus uh, 2001 hertz, then it was cal, uh, then it was page 3 to go into what was... Um, service cal and then in service cal then it was the cal time base and then we've got the DAC value there now if I adjust the DAC value yes it is altering it yes as I alter that DAC value there that you can see moving um, the time base value there at one time as I adjust this value it is moving on the frequency counter so I'll show you that now so that's the frequency counter readout there. Um, so as I adjust the knob now on the free on the DAC, you can see that it is starting to adjust. Now, obviously, with it being a reference oscillator, uh, 10 megahertz, the multiplication of the frequency changes here. Although they're very small and minute on the 10 megahertz signal, that has a major change, obviously under normal circumstances the 300 megahertz calibrator signal so I'm just winding the frequency down again the DAC value down to it's at 17 now zero so that's zero and then obviously uh, to fine tune it uh, at 10 megahertz so what we'll do we'll, we'll just select Hertz on this uh, frequency counter uh, where is it that's Hertz so let's see whether we can just adjust it down a bit. Um, hmm, it's a bit slow, you see, the refresh rate. Let's see whether we can stabilise it at bang on. <clears throat> 10 megahertz. I'm just making very fine incremental adjustments, waiting for the frequency counter just to catch up. And then just altering it a couple of dax at a time, just to see whether we can actually get it to uh, 10 megahertz or thereabouts. Oh, we're just we're just coming off there. So I'll just let see whether it, it catches up. Hopefully it will. Mm, 19, just come down a bit. I'm at that value 119 at the moment. So it's getting there, it's 4.8 hertz off now. So I'm just going to leave it for a second just to see if it updates. And then uh, 1.7 hertz of frequency. So I'm quite happy at that. I might just adjust it by one DAC level, that's one DAC level down. And just wait for the frequency counter to catch up. See what it's done. It's not changed. Oh yeah, it's, so I think just one that value higher, which is there, 
let's see whether it uh, catches up might be just 10 meg 3.8 uh, soft frequency I'm not going to worry about that but um, that stack value 114 that's 11 113 so now it's at DAC value 113 that one one increment jump which goes from 4 to 2 hertz of frequency now um, so what about 112 so DAC value 112 now and it's there we are look so we're at 10 megahertz so we're point 0.7 of a hurt of frequency so it's highly accurate is that and it's jumped down a bit now it will vary slightly I'll just put it back to uh, 113 and then leave it at that I think because that's as near as damn it as we're gonna get I think to being on frequency so I just need to now look at the um, the manual a bit further to find out now what's going on with the uh, monitor uh, the um, calibrator I need to look at that find out what's happened um, it could be that there's an issue there but I'm not sure if it can be repaired to component level that's the other thing I need to look deeper in the manual so that's what we'll do now so I'll store that I'll press enter key now on the uh, on the spectrum analyzer just so that uh, it stores that DAC value um, so that's what we'll do we'll hit the enter button so that's now stored so that's good right back soon okay I've got a block diagram up now of uh, of the uh, instrument uh, just having a quick gander at it I'm sorry that it's on its side just where Hewlett Packard I presented it in this uh, in this manual um, so obviously we've got the uh, woo -woo, front connector here uh, the switch step attenuator module which is what I showed earlier so might need to look at that a bit later on but here more importantly which is option 4 in this area here uh, this is the reference oscillator module we were looking at earlier that get, derives a 10 megahertz output uh, so we've got what appears to be on W15 I think it is coming in here the frequency tune for that which is what we were faffing about with with the DAC um, there we've got a 10 megs output by the SMB connector 0 dBm which is what it should be it looks like it breaks out into two places goes into the A25 counter block as well as coming out on a secondary then all the way along here we've got a 10 megahertz reference into what looks like a reference phase lock loop and then we've got a 300 megahertz in coming from somewhere else here uh, this looks like it's some kind of control line possibly it does say 7.5 megahertz but I'm not sure if that's a, an input or an output at the moment we've got YIG tune out uh, or is that a VTO, voltage tuned oscillator? That looks like a V for Victor, not a Y for Yankee. Anyway, there's a v tune out there. Oh, hang on. It comes in, look, into this on the third converter. The third converter control line comes in. It looks like there's an 800 megahertz on board oscillator there. It's called a VTO tune in. Probably a voltage tuned oscillator. I don't know why they just don't call it a VCO. But I could mistake that for a Y. You know, sometimes when the uh, service manuals are not very well copied, the uh, Ys can look like Vs, etc. So that's a bit of a pain. But anyway, I assume that's a voltage tuned oscillator. Control line, 800 megahertz, gets produced out, amplified. Uh, it comes out on this socket here, is 800 megahertz out, and goes into what is this. Um, uh, second converter it's multiplied by 3 to give 1.8 gigahertz which produces a second local oscillator in this mixer here um, so we've got a 2.124 gigahertz signal coming in mixed with a 1.8 gigahertz to again give 321.4 megahertz that then comes into here gets amplified filtered mixed again Ah, so if we come back to this oscillator, this uh, is that 800 megahertz or 600? 600 megahertz, sorry. 
it's not 800 megahertz, I've read it wrong. 600 megahertz comes out and gets amplified, passed out for the second converter mixer, but also it gets amplified again here into a divider with two outputs on it. The first output is amplified, buffered again, and it then divides it from 600 megahertz down to 300 megahertz. That then is fed into the mixer, so the difference between 321.4 coming in on the left is mixed with the 300 coming in here. The difference of course being 21.4, which I understand, and that then gets passed off. Well I think that's all working, because if it wasn't we wouldn't be getting a video image on the display at the, um, the signal, which we are, so I think that's all working personally, but anyway. So the second output from the what's look like to be a prescaler programmable divider whatever you want to call it that comes out there gets amplified it says a calibration amp so this is a buffer amp again and then it gets coughed up out of j2 to what is the front connector uh, 300 megs at minus 20 dbm it says there well that's interesting we've been looking at minus 10 dbm which i'm sure is what it said earlier in the manual but we'll have to check that I'm sure that says minus 20. It could also be minus 10. But that looks like a 2 to me. You see where I'm coming from with these service manuals, how the, the printing and copying can di distort the text. But anyway, um, so we've got a cal output there. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, so we've got a 300 megahertz out as well comes down here gets coughed out on J3 and then that comes all the way along here to oh 300 megahertz in there oh I see so yeah so we get a 10 meg reference coming in to this reference phase lock loop uh, the phase lock loop then looks at the output signal from the oscillator and compares in a comparator and then you've got a, a, a VTO, a voltage tuned oscillator output then on the DC control line to steer it, to control it. So I don't know, uh, it's just in two separate modules, that's all. So you basically got the, the oscillator there, it's tuning the output from the oscillator, is buffered and sent back out, comes all the way down here into a reference, into a, a phase lock loop comparator part of a, a phase lock loop system um, there must be a seven and a half megahertz output then which goes to a discriminator I assume because that's obviously getting an input I would have thought from somewhere else so the discriminator is probably for yeah so where's the YIG then let's have a look where the YIG is oh here we are this is a YIG oscillator yeah Sounds like it's a control volts line. Where does that come from then? So that control volts line goes all the way along, right the way. Oh, here we are. Look, YIG tune, oscillator driver. Uh, so I think that must be working the YIG, uh, the YTO, Yankee Tango Oscar, because we're getting that output signal fed into the power splitter, and thus it's going to. Um, the first mixer which is a 1.8 gigahertz uh, low pass filter coming in according to that mixed power splitter from the YTO mixes it again to give a 5 gigahertz um, local oscillator mixed output uh, 4.9 gigahertz bandpass filter and then that comes into the so yeah, I understand all that. that. I think the YIG must be working. We know the reference oscillator is working. If a YIG wasn't working and some of these circuits down here weren't working, we wouldn't get the mixing going on in the second and third converter. So it may be uh, that... What's interesting is well, it definitely says minus 20 there. I'm damn certain it says minus 20 doesn't say minus 10 it says minus 20 dbm so I might have to look at that again maybe that the level's okay now coming out of thing but anyway we couldn't get the frequency could we 
we couldn't change the frequency if you remember we could change the frequency of the output on this oscillator by adjusting the capacitor that's mounted on the oscillator and that made the 10 megahertz differ positive or negative of the central frequency but then uh, when we wanted to change the um, tuning of a 300 megahertz signal we weren't getting any deviation any changes on that so that could be um, this oscillator here that may have an issue um, although if it did have an issue I wouldn't have thought we'd get a video image because the converter wouldn't be working properly um, so this still could have an issue because it, it did it did look like as if when we fed the signal in from the signal generator into front of the instrument to start with it was off frequency um, so it could still be an issue in this area and the calibration amp or the uh, oscillator itself it could be an issue um, so we've got J1-11 there which looks like as if that's the input to the YIG tuned oscillator we've got some supply voltages we can check I suppose just to make sure that we've got these voltages there because you never know it might be the voltages are not there so we've also got a 600 megahertz output on this J5 I think it is if I've read that right we could check for 600 megahertz out because that would be a fixed frequency um, so yes we've got some more tests we can do so we'll look further into that yeah just looking a bit further into this it says the 10 megahertz reference is used to phase lock the 600 megahertz oscillator on the a9 third converter <coughs> excuse me uh, there are two frequency references available and it talks about a standard one which is what we have or obviously then there's the um, you know the optional precision one uh, which is option four. Uh, the output viva frequency reference is fed to panel rear panel of 10 megahertz reference output. The W16 cable that connects to the RTXO rear panel is replaced by W17. More useless information. When the OCXO is installed, the analyzer, the jumper, rear panel, blah blah blah. Um, external ref in, it goes to that, which we all know. Tell me something I don't know. A25 counter lock. The A25 counter lock assembly improves the frequency stability of the analyzer by phase lock and 600 megahertz reference on the A9 assembly to 10 megahertz frequency reference and count locking. The center frequency of the LO in spans less than or equal to 10 megahertz. Blah blah blah. 300 megahertz control lock out signal from A9 and the 10 megahertz reference. From the rear panel of the analyzer fed to the reference PLL circuitry on the A25 counter lock assembly. The 300 megahertz signal is divided by 40 to yield a 7.5 megahertz reference signal for use by the frequency counter discriminate and sampling oscillator. So that was an output then, divide by 40, even though it didn't show a divider in the, um, the comparator block. Uh, the 10 megahertz reference and 7.5 megahertz are divided and compared in a phase frequency detector. The detector output tunes a 600 megahertz reference via the VTO tune line, so it is a V. The sampling oscillator PL on A25 can be tuned between 279 megahertz to 298 in 150 kilohertz steps. The output sampling oscillator PL drives the sampler. Um, so it talks about the sampler produced 76 megahertz IF output. I think that's okay. The YIG tuned oscillator, yttrium iron garnet oscillator, which is ferromagnetic material polished onto a small sphere, blah blah blah. The A7 analog interface assembly for control current that alters the magnetic field to generate the required YTO fr frequency. The YTO provides a 2.5 one two four gigahertz to three point nine gigahertz first LO. The YTO output is sent to a power splitter in the T4 first converter assembly. The power splitter routes the first LO signal, first mixer which we've gone through, and then there's the analog interface. So we can check some voltages and signals here. And um, the um, that's the YIG anyway. It looks like it's fed through a HP Agilent. Uh, not sure if it's 10 or 20 dB attenuator or something like that anyway it looks looks like it's uh, something a bit strange I'm not sure what uh, 
what it is, but there's some kind of a an oscillator output that's fed into a um, what's like an attenuator of some description, where it goes off. So we could split a few signals off here or there and have a look, but I think we need to go back to this 600 megahertz, uh, 300 megahertz output signals from that module. Um, it was A9 A I think it was so I think if we do that uh, then we can at least um, I think it was I can just write this instrument up again this way <coughs> let's have a look this module here the calibrator so need to look at this again I think do some measurement of some signals and uh, see where we get to okay so we've sort of gone back to basics again just to retrace some of what we've done earlier and uh, what I've done is I've uh, connected to what is the third converter which is this module here with a gold connector on there which is an SMB to BNC connector and essentially what I've done, going back to the block diagram we looked at earlier, uh, we were talking about the where the 300 megahertz calibrator signal as, um, comes from, that comes from this socket. And basically it's a divided 600 megahertz signal. And as we were looking at earlier on the block diagram, it's fed into a, uh, well, a 600 megahertz oscillator, which is in situ in the third converter, that last module there. And uh, basically that outputs a signal then to a mixer uh, which is in the second converter and that then produces what would be the second IF um, and again that signal is a 600 megahertz um, signal which is fed to the second converter from the third converter so what I'm doing is I'm basically right now intercepting uh, that point there which is uh, where we've got the 600 megahertz signal coming out on a coaxial cable and then connects into the second converter which is this times three multiplier to obviously to give a, a higher frequency signal to be mixed and then obviously uh, you know produce an IF output now the 600 megahertz signal is obviously gets its reference essentially um, by via basically a um, a tune line, what's called a Victor Tango Oscar tune line, a VTO, short for voltage tuned oscillator. Uh, that in turn gets its signal from a reference phase lock loop, which has a uh, 300 megahertz signal coming in, uh, which if we remember earlier, is actually a multiplied um, signal. It's divided basically, you've got a 600 megahertz uh, signal coming out, it gets amplified, divided and then the output from that then is fed out to what is the cal out at 300 megahertz. So it's the divider which produces the 300 megahertz signal as a direct derivative from the 600 megahertz signal. At the same time, 300 megahertz signal is fed into the mixer and then it's buffered, fed out then onto what is the 300 megahertz uh, outline which then goes then into the reference PLL so this is basically phase comparator uh, we've got a 10 megahertz TCXO temperature control crystal oscillator input there as well um, which then is obviously derived from this which is the um, what would be an option for if that was a high stability one but in this case it's just a that little PCB that we had with a can with a little trimmer capacitor in it we were looking at earlier so the 10 megahertz signals there because we verified that that could be tuned and adjusted and the DAC value changed its frequency as well as physically tuning the capacitor within the 10 megahertz oscillator um, we were struggling to get a bang on frequency of 300 megahertz and so what I've done I've just come back now to basics um, because off camera what I've done there's some tuning that you can do on this module uh, which is there's some um, potentiometers just down here it's very difficult to see at this camera angle but there's one there for the frequency the 600 megahertz course frequency adjustment and then there's another one a bit further down here which is for the uh, the actual level the 300 megahertz level which comes out the calibrator now in doing that 
fiddling off screen just to try and get fathom out where we are with the frequency stability because that was the issue earlier with the frequency stability being off um, I've generated from my Marconi signal generator a 100 megahertz signal which has been fed from there at 0 dBm that's being fed into the input now on the n-type socket here and then we're now measuring that now I've got I managed to achieve um, although I'm just waiting for some more um, time to go by to see how stable it is I've basically set the span uh, to one megahertz and it's actually quite accurate now is a frequency now the level itself is wrong because I'm measuring actually um, if I can see that on the screen properly um, that is neg 19.27 dBm when it's actually 0 dBm now it could be that I can calibrate that out if we can actually get the frequency to remain stable and bang on frequency we might be able to calibrate out the um, we might be able to calibrate out that level error because it uses a cal signal to calibrate the level as well as the frequency stability now if you remember earlier when we first started the video the frequency was way off and I think it could be uh, potentially that the 10 meg oscillator was uh, physically so far off frequency that it couldn't capture the frequency um, as part of and I'm, I'm clutching at the straws here when I say this because it's more or less behaving itself now but the only thing that we've done really is to manually tune the 10 megahertz oscillator tuning the, the trimmer capacitor uh, using as if you recall earlier the this trimming tool now in doing so that seems to have made a major improvement in the frequency accuracy of the instrument insofar as it not drifting way off frequency because earlier on as I say we wouldn't have been able to achieve this measurement because the frequency would be so far off so I think it could be and I'm only clutching at the straws when I say this and uh, it's good to hypothesize that the oscillator was too far off frequency for the 600 megahertz phase lock loop to capture it and in other words it had made the 600 megahertz signal which obviously ultimately gets the 10 megahertz reference um, go drifting way off and it may not be able to capture it and um, you might recall on the Marconi 2955 one of the repair videos I did we had a 200 megahertz oscillator on the Marconi 2955 it was a, a local oscillator that was running on a PCB that produced an IF um, for frequencies below I think it was 88 megahertz from 400 kilohertz to 88 megahertz and it's how the Marconi 2955 derives its frequency output from the RF signal generator between 400 kilohertz to 88 megahertz by mixing two signals together one of which is the local oscillator 200 megahertz signal and the other then is the variable frequency oscillator which changes its frequency in accordance with what generator frequency output you want and the two mixed together creates the actual fundamental and we had an issue there in that instrument where the 200 megahertz oscillator is manually tuned with a capacitor and if the tuning's too far off the synthesizer can't capture it can't grab it and pull it into lock and therefore it remains way off frequency and wouldn't tune to the desired frequency that we're wanting and I somehow suspect that might be the case here because we've got now um, having carried out the manual tuning of the um, of the 10 megahertz oscillator we've now got more or less a frequency lock now obviously um, the DAC value changing in the calibration menu the service menu on the instrument we couldn't pull the 10 megahertz oscillator about um, greatly it was only a minor change here or there so I think it perhaps needed that manual intervention in order to coarsely bring the frequency of the oscillator closer to the 10 megahertz point before then naturally the 600 megahertz and the 300 megahertz would track with that and therefore their frequencies would be massively changed with such small incremental changes in the 10 megahertz reference oscillator the 
10 megs only has to alter just slightly for a huge fundamental change in the 600 megahertz and hence 300 megahertz calibration signal and it could be that then the DAC values if you remember earlier when we tried in the service maintenance menu of the instrument we tried then to um, make the DAC value change the frequency of a calibrator signal which it didn't do and I think it's because it had gone too far off frequency so by netting the uh, oscillator by using the trimmer tool we've fundamentally changed its frequency more closely then to where it, the oscillator can grab it and then remain in the phase lock loop condition and so now we're seeing this high stability I mean we would never have got that I mean the span there if I put that now at 500 kilohertz and uh, and look at that we're still seeing that signal on the screen and that certainly would not have been possible I think when we first started this repair it was 10 megahertz of frequency at least and that was on a good day so for it to remain as stable as it is um, at 500 kilohertz bandwidth it's still a little off frequency we might be able to do some more adjustments and then once we get it close enough we can do a calibration so basically what I've done I'm intercepting right now the point between the uh, third converter and the second converter and this is where the 600 megahertz signal escapes the third converter and then enters the second converter for mixing with the RF input signal so we've teed off we've basically got a T here um, and we're not interfering with the connectivity between the third converter and the second converter the 600 megahertz output which is from this socket here we're fitting that into a T one part of it is the coaxial cable uh, here which goes to the second converter which is this module here this is basically where all the fun and games happens and uh, the mixing goes on in there because this is obviously where the RF input is uh, and then we have a sampler taken off there on an SMB to BNC converter to the Marconi frequency counter. Now, I've got this situation now where I'm, I'm going to try and set the Marconi now frequency counter to show us what the frequency error is of a 600 megahertz signal. So if I press the set key here and enter in 600 six zero zero and then set it's showing that was 74.8 kilohertz of frequency so that's roughly how far off frequency the 600 megahertz signal is off so there is a, a frequency adjust um, available on the third converter which we can alter the 600 megahertz output frequency it influences the uh, what is the VTO line here on the 600 megahertz it controls that 600 megahertz oscillator to adjust its frequency slightly and we might be able then at this point to where we're measuring now to recover that frequency uh, accuracy and there's a, a potentiometer in the third converter that you access through the top which I'm going to show you in a moment uh, but basically that's how it works so We've got um, two potentiometers, 600 megahertz, coarse frequency adjust there, and that's the level adjust for then the calibrator, the 300 megahertz output. So we'll have a look at that next, see whether we can adjust it. It might be that I just have to twiddle the 10 meg oscillator again on the other side of the instrument where we were looking at earlier to get that frequency down if it's too far off. So there's a few little things that we can tinker with here, but once I get that frequency correct, then uh, I think we'll be okay. Now the 300 megahertz signal as well, we'll have a look at that now to see what the calibrate is like on the output. Okay, so we're, uh, we're 69.97 kilohertz of frequency. It's coming down all the time, but gradually, very slowly. Um, so we'll, we'll try and adjust it. So inside uh, we've got here what is the uh, the 600 megahertz um, frequency adjust 
which is here so I can try and adjust that frequency now potentiometer if I can get on it there we are right then so if I just move the camera over to the frequency counter again now if I twiddle that um, potentiometer just beginning to move it one way that's fully counterclockwise and we can't get it any lower than 67 kilohertz of frequency it's minus 67 kilohertz of frequency at the moment now if I turn it clockwise as you can see you know we're naturally getting an increase in frequency now it's fully clockwise now insofar as the readout on the display is concerned uh, you'll be able to see just what would be a minor change at that so if I turn it fully counterclockwise again you can see the marker position is moving towards the top of the signal which it would do because it's pulling it into net and then we're still off frequency though by somewhat uh, I mean if I were to alter the, the span to 10 kilohertz um, then we're off the page we're off the you know the screen we can just start to see a bit of a lift in there as it's climbing up but if I alter that then to uh, 50 kilohertz and uh, sorry 50 kilohertz not 50 megahertz so that's 50 kilohertz as you can see it's sort of trying to exit stage right so if I move the uh, potentiometer now fully clockwise as you'll see the frequency starting to trying to exit stage right and that's as maximum as I can get it there and then that's fully counterclockwise, so that's the minimum that I can achieve. Which, according to the measurement from the uh, frequency counter, it's off by about uh, 67 kilohertz. So, we might have to um, just turn the instrument on its side again and then adjust the 10 megahertz oscillator to see whether or not that will pull it in. Now, what I tend to do in that case. Is I'll adjust the actual potentiometer to midway on the uh, 600 megahertz third um, converter, the A9 board. So at the moment it's fully counterclockwise, and I'd probably set it midway between counterclockwise and clockwise, and then adjust then the course frequency adjustment of the 10 megahertz oscillator to try and net that frequency in. Then the potentiometer then uh, that's currently on the 600 megahertz converter would then be adjustable either way in order to finish off the final part of the adjustment so that's something we can experiment with now right so we've got uh, the 10 megahertz oscillator uh, disconnected from the instrument I've had to undo the screws to get it out so let's just see what we can do now with that frequency Bear in mind, of course, this needs to be right in the middle of the screen and that really needs to be reading as close to zero as possible so that we know that the 600 megahertz uh, frequency is, is correct. Now then, let's adjust this capacitor on here. See whether we can get any major changes. I'm not seeing any major change yet, but there again my uh, trimmer tool has decided to break at the end there I'm using one of these old ones that I've collected over the years that's no good anymore let's try another one a better one here we are got a new one after have to bin that one right so let's see what we can do about this uh, this frequency I'll set these little trimmer capacitors are sometimes quite difficult to get on to um, so we're not making much progress so I can't uh, make major adjustments there but it's not making any difference really so it could be that the uh, the oscillator itself is uh, not locking so yes interesting Hmm. Just disconnect the uh, the power to it. See whether it, it 
so even with the uh, signal removed I think once it's gone into lock then it will remain in lock we'll probably have to power cycle the instrument because I've removed the power to the 10 meg reference oscillator board so you know if that, that signal naturally should be needed to uh, allow the phase lock loop of 600 megahertz signal to uh, to operate and naturally if that's not present that signal that shouldn't be there anyway it should have vanished so there's something strange going on here um, I think there's an issue in the third converter where there's something it's come up with a message though on the screen talking about the fact that it's lost the oscillator so I don't know there's something strange going on with it um, under normal circumstances removing that would have um, made a major difference to the measurement there it would have just vanished because without having a reference oscillator running it, there would have been nothing to compare the signal with and therefore it wouldn't have um, been able to display the signal in the first place so let's set the frequency then to uh, 100 megahertz uh, a span of uh, 1 megahertz and we'll have the amplitude, yeah that's okay I'll set now the span again just to see whether we can still get 50 kilohertz and we can so it's not as if it's made any major change that so we have got a 10 megahertz signal coming out of this module uh, we know that to be correct because we measured that earlier but the frequency here that doesn't seem to be making any adjustment there um, I thought it would do making a course adjustment there but it's it's not doing so um, so it does look like as if at this stage um, and reading the service manual the issue probably lay in the third converter 600 megahertz oscillator section um, so we can have a look at that next anyway see if we can get the board out and have a look at it but uh, we can't influence its frequency and it should have locked you know it should be locked and uh, it's not so hmm interesting we uh, we move onwards ever further okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, just calibrate that 10 megahertz signal again so we'll change the input over to A on here uh, we'll go to input A we've got our SMB connector now we can disconnect that on the thing and being careful not to let the ground of that outer shell touch the PCB otherwise we'll have a fireball so let's go to uh, this SMB plug it on there and let's see what frequency we're going to get now so again we've got the um, 10 meg signal there of uh, set One zero set. So we're a hundred and thirty three point uh, one three three kilohertz. So we're hundred and thirty three hertz of frequency. So let's just uh, adjust this trimmer cap. I just want to get this back on frequency again, as close to ten megahertz as I possibly can. At least we know that's running. So something strange going on with that 600 megahertz oscillator. I mean, it shouldn't be getting anything at the moment because if it hasn't got that reference signal, because I've disconnected it, because obviously we've connected this to the frequency counter, then uh, you know, then it shouldn't actually be be running at all. So I think something's free running here. Uh, probably that 600 megahertz oscillator is just free running, and it's not in phase lock with the reference oscillator. And that's probably the problem now because the fact that the reference oscillator is having no influence on the 600 megahertz frequency generation in the third converter means potentially um, the oscillator is just free running and um, it's not actually phase locked. So that means then obviously no matter what frequency the reference oscillator is adjusted to as per the earlier experiments that we did it merely implies that there is no relationship between the reference oscillator and the phase lock loop PLL um, which there should be obviously 
and that's what would ultimately bring the frequency of the instrument back into stability and accuracy. So we need to uh, examine the third converter now more closely. It could be that one of the prescaler ICs, programmable dividers, it could also be the phase lock loop circuitry in the other converter module that we're looking at earlier on the block diagram. It potentially could be um, a buffer amplifier that's failed and thus it's not being able to loop back the signal and then, then the sampler cannot get an adequate level of signal in order to interpret it. There's all kinds of things that could be wrong here so we're just going to have to play it by ear and uh, whip the module out and have a look at it and see whether we can find anything obvious that's there. So we'll have a look anyway at the diagram again and see what uh, what we can find. Now that we know that this is having no impact at all on the uh, on the running of the 600 megahertz side of things. Okay, so we've got a third converter. I'm just taking all the screws out, trying to get it out because it's a bit of a pain. There's a T marked here, so I think somebody's looked at this before, obviously. Why that's got a T and none of the others, I don't know. Maybe T means terminal? I have no idea. Um, who knows? But anyway, let's pull this module out for a converter and have a look at it. Looks like it's uh, there's a couple of filter adjustment capacitors there with the inductor and capacitive elements um, got one IC on there um, this looks like it's a not sure if that that looks like a multi circuit device and IC as well these in these package styles but uh, just looking to see if I can see anything obvious you know that stands out I mean the 600 megahertz signal is, is here on this end connector uh, that one there J5 so that's obviously uh, and then it's print looks like one of these boards where it's uh, multi layered maybe Yeah, we've got a 600 megahertz signal path coming down here. There's a bit of print goes to there. Then there's a couple of resistors that feed it across to this side. Then it goes off down this track, down there, down there. So it's round about this area of a circuit board where the 600 megahertz signal sort of derived from. Um, But um, it does look like as if this board's faulty because obviously we have the um, the frequency lock goes on external to this, but this derives the 600 megahertz oscillator, which is on here, and the dividers are on uh, probably one of these two I think that one of the, that'll be the divider I think but I could be wrong um, obviously got a mixer here this is the mixer I believe that U4 there's um, something going on there so I'll have a look at the diagram just to familiarize ourselves but I don't think there's much I can do really I mean at most with that is probably to uh, just blanket replace some of the ICs, these two ICs if I can get them. The trouble is these devices are quite specialist to get hold of and uh, they're very unique and quite difficult to get, get access to. So that's the frequency adjust potentiometer, this, uh, this blue potentiometer here and uh, that obviously controls the DC level. So there's the 600 megahertz oscillator, I believe, will be in this sort of area of the PCB. Um, we've got obviously a control lock out there, output which may be derived from this U3. It certainly looks the case. And then we have then the 
uh, 321.4 megahertz input on this side and uh, and then that's the filter the 321.4 megahertz filter so yeah we've got a bipolar transistor there with the look of it that Q10 which looks like it's a, a small signal amplifier I can't see any burning any charring I'm going to have a closer look at the board off camera but I can't see any dry joints anywhere or anything like that um, looks like as if perhaps somebody's reworked these pins here because when you look closely at these pins they are actually quite blobulated with newer looking solder on and one or two of them were quite raised prominent so it might be somebody's reflowed those connectors but uh, yeah I can't understand what's going on there I don't think I've got a spare one of these either from this series of spectrum analyzers some of the other HP Agilent spectrum analyzers are for spare parts are newer than this particular analyzer different models so I don't think I've got any any of these boards but certainly that would be a good way to try one out is to put one in and see if it works um, but yeah, I'm just going to have a look at the diagram a little bit more and in comparison to what we can see here okay just analyzing this a bit closer we've got uh, obviously the 600 megahertz outputs on this uh, connector there but looking down it uh, we've got a what looks to be a um, another small signal transistor this Q13 uh, again we've got these two here um, we've got a Veracta diode uh, which I'm sure is this device here um, I think that's a Veracta diode it certainly looks it to me but I could be wrong, I could be wrong but I'm willing to bet that it is um, I think we've got some kind of a an oscillator, probably well, Colpitz oscillator, something like that running at 600 megahertz we've got an MCL, oh, an MC12090L uh, and then that I see there, now that looks a bit odd, that one. Oh, Philippines, what's that one then? Let's have a look. Smallest number known to man written on the top of it. So I bet that's a prescaler, that a divider, programmable divider. Um, that's the output level, the cal output adjust frequency. So I think that's the divider. Mm, dear, look at that, my trimming tool's uh, broken on one side. Anyway, so this little chip here again these specialized um, chips that are in these packages so there's something uh, something going on around here I think I'm just having a closer look see if I can see anything that's obvious that stands out any burning discoloration any uh, anything like that there's nothing obvious so it might just be a component that's uh, that looks like a reactor as well potentially. Some of these glass type uh, diodes can be reactors as well. So I'm just trying to sort of see the, the, the oscillator steering line. I think this is the oscillator, these two devices possibly linked with this device here and uh, this Veracta and I think that's the 600 megahertz oscillator and uh, that's the lock output so I think there's uh, something wrong on here could be anything you know it could be anything it could be a case of I would take transistors often do transistor testing on them just to see whether the function or the gates on them are functional the uh, junctions um, as for this IC that's probably obtainable maybe uh, this device I've seen this in other HP Agilent equipment and I'm absolutely 99.9% .9 certain that's a, a divider 
again with uh, more bipolar transistors which may need testing further and removing taking out and uh, so yes but again we're clutching at the straws because there's no circuit diagram for this uh, PCB so whether we're able to progress with it I don't know but um, anyway we'll have a look at the diagram and see what that says now Hmm, looking at the diagram a bit closer, uh, which we can see here, I think um, the 600 megahertz oscillator, I think that's actually this here. Um, this Veractor diode and that Q13, and um, I think this is the, os the 600 megahertz oscillator. I think these two devices here, um, because of the symmetry and the way that they're aligned on this board, I think they're probably these buffer amplifiers, uh, which is the these two. One's obviously feeding the 300 megahertz signal out to the calibrator, and the other then feeds the signal back then to what is the phase comparator in the other module. So I think those two devices there are potentially buffers. I could be wrong. I mean, obviously, there's not just those two devices. There's another device here and another one there. So it could be because there's potentially four buffers. There's one, two, uh, three, four, five. Is there five of these devices? Well, there's one, two, three, four. I can't see a fifth as such. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, potentially that's what they could be. This, the, this filter, 320 odd megahertz filter here uh, is um these two and the mixer so i think the mixer is this silver can that's the 321.4 megahertz bandpass filters which you can tune here uh, again with another buffer and a variable attenuator so there'll be a mixture of pin diodes and things like that on here for the variable attenuator plus the Veractors, but I've got a sneaky feeling that's the Veractor there, and then that's the oscillator transistor for 600 megahertz, and this is the the oscillator in this area. I think these are the buffers, and then obviously it goes off then to the uh, necessary stages. It just shows in the block diagram for the third converter the divider. Um, for the 600 megahertz signal to divide it down to 300 megahertz so it's interesting is that very very interesting so it's obviously not got any influence over the tune so we're displaying a, an image on the screen of the spectrum analyzer so the oscillator is running as we proved 600 megahertz is there the 10 megahertz reference He's also going to the phase comparator. It could be something like the buffer amp that's for um, sending out a buffered amplified signal on the 300 megahertz output line to the phase comparator is not working. So that will be this line here that goes that way and then out. So we'll need to have a look to see whether there's anything on that socket there, uh, which I believe is uh, J3. So we'll, we could put the module back in and see whether we've got a signal there on J3 and see what level it is, because it might be a too low level to be detected by the, what is the, uh, uh, this reference PLL. Um, where is it? See if I can get it on camera. So this reference PLL here, we've got that 300 megahertz input coming in, which is obviously fed from the output of this buffer amp in the third converter which could be one of those bipolar devices as well there could be one of these two transistors again it's very difficult to try and diagnose simply because of the fact that there isn't a diagram for this board just a block diagram I mean it shows uh, potentially one two three four buffers plus a divider and as we can see we can more or less get that symmetry with those components but yet yeah, we don't have the two ICs shown and what function they could give it could be that this, I'm going to look this number up now 
uh, one of these ICs could be an oscillator in itself which is externally controlled using a Veractor diode um, so that's also another thing uh, and then buffered by the amplifiers so I'll try and get some information on these part numbers now and see what they are just a little bit closer now to discovering what these ICs are I've just looked up the data sheets for these two ICs uh, this one here um, is a uh, when I click on here is a PLL um, high speed prescaler so that's the uh, divider the look of it this device here is a HP Agilent part number uh, which is a HP 1826-0372 now for that it does say that it is a Hewlett Packard Core IC 5 GHz limiter amplifier 8 pin in plastic so that's an amplifier is that up to 5 GHz now the data sheet for this device describes it as it says the MC12090 is a high speed D master slave flip flop capable of toggle rates of over 700 megahertz it was designed primarily for high speed prescaling applications in communications and instrumentation this device employs two inputs two clock inputs as well as complementary Q and Q outputs uh, it says there are no set or reset inputs so again could be these ICs um, so yes that's all part of it so not sure though why they'd use two different ICs considering on the diagram they're doing the same function according to that unless there's half of the IC in this particular this particular package does something else as part of the oscillator circuitry and then the other half is used as the the divider the prescaler bit um, and this is then obviously the divider as well so that it could be there's two halves of it I don't know it just depends how the designer's done it but um, I don't know if I'll be able to get that IC assuming it's not working but um, could be anything really so I think we need to go back to J3 on the diagram that we looked at earlier to see if a 300 megahertz buffered output is leaving this device to go to the other module um, which contains then the phase comparator for the uh, voltage tuned oscillator input I see whether it steers about so we can have a look at that anyway because the um, the sockets are accessible for that on the top here so you know we can we can measure that so we'll see what we can do right J3 is here um, so what we need to do we need to intercept that now because naturally once we unplug that from here then we we'll disturb the oscillator because naturally um, it would lose the signal uh, assuming it's there of course going to what is the um, the phase lock loop which is on another part of the system we were looking at earlier on the diagram where it compares the 10 meg input as well as what comes out of here which should be the 600 megahertz and then uh, the difference then would be the tune volts and the tune volts then would obviously move the Veractor diode uh, or the oscillator influence its frequency to keep the 600 megahertz on frequency and thus then the accuracy of the instrument will be maintained now because we've unplugged this means that then potentially that loop if it is in lock goes out of lock and therefore it can mess our measurement up so what we need to do is to introduce a jumper lead a T jumper lead where we can connect onto there uh, onto this SMB for J3 and at the same time maintain that continuity that connection then to the rest of the system so we've got that now we've got a T point now we can feed that off to our frequency counter to look to see what frequencies coming out on here what level even as well with a level meter to see whether we can read anything I'm going to use a frequency count in the first instance because I want to see whether there's anything coming out 
and then we can look at what level is coming out then versus what it says it should be in the service manual so that's what we'll do next okay so we've powered it on now what I'm going to do I've got my uh, voltmeter here and uh, we're just going to check to see if there's any DC on this uh, RF line because what I don't want to be doing is plugging something with a DC bias on it onto my test equipment because then we could blow up the frequency counter level meter etc so I've just gone on with this probe just to see whether or not uh, we've got any voltage there and we don't we don't have any DC volts on that pin so that's good I just want to make sure of that because once we connect that off if it has say you know 30 volts or whatever as a tune line something like that then uh, you know potentially we could blow up the frequency counter that uh, we plug into it so right now I'm ready to make a frequency measurement um, so if I just move that back round again and um, let's see whether we can uh, we can see what the frequency measurement would be so right let's just straighten the camera up so we've got a good picture so we'll get our SMB now that connects into uh, into there. Let's have a look. Uh, we'll just get rid of that. Right. Go on to. It's going to be around about the 300 megahertz marker. So I just need to move the ports over on the frequency counter to port B, which is 50 to 600 megahertz, and then connect on here. Our uh, trusty little SMB and so we do have a 300 megahertz signal as near as damn it anyway coming up a 299.964 whatever it is kilohertz so it was quite close to that frequency um, so yes that that is there but what level it is remains to be seen so I'll probably use a spectrum analyzer now um, get that down connect that up to see what level that is and look in the manual to see what level it should be versus what it actually is that will tell us whether the buffered output that's leaving j3 are here which goes off then to the phase comparator um, is the correct level because if it's too low the rf level the phase comparator won't receive the sufficient signal drive in order to be able to reference it so that's what we need to look at now regarding the level that's coming out of there I think it will be there personally um, but obviously the level is what's important now according to the information that's in the service manual um, which we can look at now obviously the phase comparator that's J3 there where we're, we're going out on uh, that that line there, J3, doesn't help with the light, I suppose, being in the way. So that's J3 there. We're measuring that there, and that goes all the way down to this reference PLL on the A25 counter block. So that's where you know the fun and games goes on between the 10 megahertz reference signal coming in and then the 300 megahertz output which has been divided from the third converter and that then in itself then produces a steering voltage which then goes through the the processor card onto the motherboard circuitry and it will enter the um, the sockets if you remember at the bottom of this module the third converter module there were two black PCB sockets that plug in to the motherboard down there so the tune volts will enter there and then tune the varactor or influence the 600 megahertz oscillator to move and thus adjust the frequency on the 300 megahertz side as well so it looks like anyway at least we've got a good indication of what signal is there um, we just need to now measure the level and see what uh, what it is it may be there's no reference information in the service man as to what level that should be either but anyway well we can have a look for nothing can't we right we've connected up the uh, what is the output now of j3 uh, to the power detector probe the marconi 
um, RF power meter, uh, the 6960B, uh, which is this here, this instrument. And as we can see, we're measuring uh, minus 8.1 dBm is the RF level. Now, I can't find anywhere in the diagram any reference to what level that should be, but um, I'm just going to read on now to see where it talks about the um, levels that should be there and see whether that compares with what it should be. That will give us an indication. Um, but obviously minus 8 dBm is a relatively strong signal. Um, you know, it could be 0 dBm it meant to be, but 8 dB here there could, could make the difference. Um, it doesn't really go into great detail about that so it may be that um, you know we, ca we can't ascertain what level it should be um, I'm just having a quick look now in this in the service information to see whether or not you know we've got any info there about it but again that's the uh, the challenge now is to try and find some information about that a13 assembly let's have a look see what we can find see what we can find <coughs> excuse me instrument sets for power level measurements analog interface a counter lock hello section third converter 300 mega cow signal 3600 mega reference the A5 this is here converts to 321.4 which is that bumper sort we were looking at 600 megahertz reference is divided to produce a 300 megahertz third local oscillator for to LO section in chapter 7 for stability of 600 megahertz reference we might have to look at chapter 7 uh, 21.4 it doesn't mention anything else there so we're on chapter 6 at the moment 6.11 so let's see whether we can get to chapter 7 and see what it says about that so what's this 6.35 chapter 7 where are we what chapter is that then chapter 7 7.13 counter lock assembly uh, that's the RF local oscillator section troubleshooting. Ah, see we are. Look. Okay, the third converter performs the following: down converts 321.4 megahertz to file 21.4 IF, generates a 300 megahertz third local oscillator, provides variable gain of a calibration amplifier, which we went through earlier in the video, if you remember. Generate 600 megahertz second local oscillator drive signal for the A5 second converter assembly. Um, generates 300 megahertz cal out signal at minus 20 dBm. Provides a buffered 300 megahertz to drive the external reference PLL circuitry on A25 counter lock. Refer to fold out 7A third count assembly block diagram end of this section. Digital operation of the A9 assembly. The second local oscillator, uh, the output of the 600 megahertz surface acoustic wave saw filter oscillator is buffered. Provide a second local oscillator to the A5 second converter. This signal is further buffered, divided by two, and buffered again to produce three 300 megahertz outputs. The amplitude of a 300 megahertz signal from the calibrate is minus 20 dBm. But it tells us sod all about what the RF level should be coming from J3. The 300 megahertz signal sent to the 300 megahertz buffer produces the other two 300 megahertz outputs. So that's all it tells you. 300 megahertz third local oscillator sent to the mixer filter. Feedback signal sent, that's the one we're looking at now on J3, I believe. Feedback signal sent to the A25 counter lock assembly. The counter lock buffer. The signal is divided down and compared with the 10 megahertz reference in a phase frequency detector on A25 assembly. The output of the phase 
frequency detector VTO underscore tune is fed back to the 600 megahertz surface acoustic wave oscillator to increase its frequency stability so it doesn't tell you what level it should be anyway we know what level it is now it's minus 8 dBm so it's a fairly strong signal is minus 8 dBm you know so I think we can more or less say that that's correct so it could be then the phase comparator on the A25 assembly that's at fault but uh, we're not getting any control of the oscillator so really um, I think we're looking well we're clutching at the the straws really because the third converter here shows the 600 megahertz oscillator and that then has got its its um, control volts control J3 there we are look so VTO tune this possibly could be looked at next see where the tune voltage moves about um, because what we could do is remove a 10 megs reference oscillator which is coming in uh, from down here the 10 megahertz is coming in to this divide by 100 if we remove that this voltage will probably change quite wildly because it's lost its references then trying to obviously influence this frequency so if I could find uh, I think that's J4 on the external reference PLL ice module wherever that is I think it's on the uh, P25 wherever that is module then we could see that voltage move wildly it does say there the processor video thing it comes in through that board then onto the motherboard there might be an access point there to see where that is J1 pin 11 is where the volts tune comes in so we could go on to J1 pin 11 on the motherboard and see what happens on that line if this is steering all over the place um, and this isn't following it then naturally that would indicate that the 600 megahertz oscillator can't be controlled so the fault's likely to be in the third converter however if it does not change this voltage here when we remove the um, what is the 10 megahertz reference oscillator signal then the fault would be on the external ref PLL board which I think is reference to P25 module on the frequency counter module so I think that's where we're going to have the issue if that's the case but it's just a case now going on to J1 pin 11 of the motherboard where the um, third converter connects to see what the VTO tune line's doing if it ain't moving much then you know when we alter the um, remove the reference oscillator then the faults in this area so I think that's where we need to be next okay we're making some more progress now just to explain where uh, what I've just done off camera um, this is an exploded uh, version or, or diagram of the um, module that we're looking at and I'm just trying to find the pinouts obviously it says they're J4 pin 40 and I've been looking for J4 and it transitions over via this W14 wiring loom uh, then to what is the A16 processor board which sits at the end of the instrument and that enters at J2 pin 40 uh, on there before naturally passing through then to J1 pin 29 at the, um, at the processor board before moving then into the motherboard which ultimately then connects back to the oscillator. Um, so I've been trying to find a convenient way of connecting to the signal that will be present on here, the voltage. Now the thing is, um, looking at the spectrum analyzer, um, 
can just move that a little bit, I think. Let's have a look. We've got J4, which I managed to find, is this connector here. This ribbon cable goes off to the counter module and uh, goes down here and disappears off right down this and then connects into this module here. Uh, the other ribbon cable is for the step attenuator which is here, that's the RF input step attenuator module. Anyway, J4 is on the um, processor board because this is a processor board. J4 is there. Now it's going to be very difficult to try and get a probe in there or I'll have to take this out, solder a wire on and it's a lot of faffing about. But if we turn the instrument round, because you've got your you got your motherboard there basically for the modules here, the RF modules. But there's like a, um, a chassis between that and these boards on this side. So these boards on this side, um, there's like a, this part of your motherboard here is the only bit that exposed, but all, all this uh, is on top of that motherboard. So it's quite difficult to get to. But... Uh, nevertheless, what I have found is a couple of things here. Uh, there's another socket, uh, which is just here. You probably just see the pins there, on there. And that that is actually uh, J1. Is this? That's J1. So, uh, pin one of J1 is actually on this side, because on the silk screen on the other side it says one just here so one of these pins is uh, probably the top left is pin one um, so we can now make a reference to J1 now then J1's on the processor board so if we have a look here at the processor board uh, we're looking at J1 pin 29 according to that information there on the on the manual just here j1 pin 29 i believe that is um so that is where the voltage tuned oscillator control line is because then obviously it goes to the motherboard and uh, that's where it picks it off so it's a little bit strange this diagram how it shows it because the actual uh, j4 which is all all this uh, J2 rather here that is on the top of the board or the processor board uh, which comes in there um, and then which is also part of J4's assembly comes in at the top and then comes out on the bottom uh, which is down here on J1 and that then enters the motherboard it gets passed through the motherboard and then it goes um, via where the plug-in modules are because obviously the plug-in modules are beneath this um, area here so the motherboard continues underneath this module and then all the third converter module and all the other modules that are on the other side are plugged in there onto this board because it's a multi-layered cake basically. So I'd be quite happy getting onto uh, that um, socket there that comes from the processor to um, find that uh, J2 pin 40 is allegedly uh, where it it leaves the it enters the processor board on j2 pin 40 and it exits on j1 pin 29 so now that i've got the socket there being obviously the motherboard j1 means that potentially i can pick it up on pin 29 now um, that looks like as if it's it's either, it's either 29 I think it's 29 it's very difficult again because the, the manual's been copied multiple times so let's just see whether we can 
zoom in on that because again it's one of these things it could be 20 it could be 28 it could be 29 i think it's 29 because that looks like an eight i'm just magnifying the screen from me magnifying glass but if we just come right in that looks like j1 pin 29 that looks like i'm analyzing that really carefully because that's a you see it could be a 20 as well because that's a zero there that's a zero it's more uniform circle whereas that definitely looks like a nine to me yeah there's definitely a break just there and that's that's 28 so i'm confident that pin 29 of j1 is where we need to be and uh, and that way then I think we're good to go measuring there, so let's have a go at that. Lovely. Well, we've soldered a wire on now to what is pin 29 of J1, uh, which is per the diagram is a tune volts. This incidentally that was plugged in there earlier, this is J2. Uh, when we look at the diagram here, uh, we've got a J2 where it connects between. So it goes between the these two sockets on the motherboard uh, which is it illustrated here now well, I've got continuity to make sure I'm actually on the correct pin here with a blue wire I've actually put continuity meter on between pin 29 of J1 and pin 20 of J2 uh, which is is down here uh, J2 so I've gone across the pins on there to uh, check the continuity between the two pins on there so I know that's correct so we're ready to do a voltage measurement now. I'm just going to plug that back in and uh, and then basically top and bottom of it is we'll uh, be in a position then to make a measurement the DC level that's on the on that pin and uh, then we should be in a position then to know roughly where the fault lay. So there we go. Right so we're uh, we're measuring now the blue wire uh, with the test probe up here connected to pin 29 of uh, J2 uh, J1 rather and we're not getting any tune volts uh, what I'd expect to see with it being a, 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 a phase lock loop is you normally have what's called a loop filter uh, which is on the the output of the PLL and uh, although it doesn't show it here in the block diagram because it's not to that level Basically, on the reference phase lock loop, the output of this would normally be a, a train of pulses, depending positive or negative, going depending on the um, how far off frequency these two reference points are. So, the 300 megahertz coming in, if it's quite a way off frequency, the pulses will be quite large in amplitude, and the mark space ratio between them will change depending on how far off frequency they are. And basically, um, as the pulses get further apart, um, then naturally the voltage would be um, less after it's gone through what's called a loop filter, which is an RC network, to smooth out the train of pulses and give a constant DC level. And then obviously as the pulses, pulse width modulation narrows and, and the pulses are more frequent, then the voltage, the DC voltage will start to rise. And the further apart they get the DC voltage averages would tend to come down so it can steer the oscillator one way or the other by influencing that tune voltage now uh, normally the loop filter is on the output of the phase lock loop IC and then it just gives a steady DC out depending on you know where it's steering it left or right um, some PLLs depending on how the design can steer with a minus voltage and, and swing to zero and then to plus depends what type of reactor tuning or other tuning influences that it's, it's in design or alternatively it can be just from zero volts as the bare minimum right up to say plus five volts and it will then swing between that voltage and that will then tune the oscillator massively across its operational frequency range so it all depends you see on uh, on that but i would expect to see a minimum of, of pulses coming out and we've got the scope meter there and as you can see uh, there is a zilch coming out there's 45 millivolts and just a load of noise so i would side on the on the guess that it would be the reference pll 
in this um, frequency converter module which is um, when it wants to play ball by moving let's have a look here just zoom back out let's have a look oops on past it so frequency counter reference PLL so in the A25 counter uh, module that's where that would be so we've got the sampler there there's a module plugs in frequency counter we've also got an oscillator in there as well there's quite a few things going on but that separate entity uh, there's a 7.5 megahertz output as well from that to the discriminator as well into the frequency counter so this reference PLL outputs not only a control voltage to the uh, voltage tuned oscillator which is in the third converter which naturally stabilizes a 600 megahertz signal but indeed it also passes a 7.5 megahertz signal down to the discriminator and also to the sampling oscillator phase lock loop as well as the frequency counter so it's quite important is this reference phase lock loop so it could be that it's outputting those signals as it should be but um, the actual control volts line which goes through from J4 which is on the top of the uh, um, control board the um, processor board that's J4 um, goes through J4 and enters the top of the um, processor board and then comes out on J1 which is underneath pin 29 which is where we're soldered to enters J2 which is the other socket I showed you that's blue uh, and then from there it goes on then into the motherboard section comes out of the motherboard then on the sockets underneath uh, these modules here the sockets that are down there on the motherboard that these modules plug into uh, it then comes out there and then enters the oscillator within the card that we were looking at earlier uh, which then obviously controls the output frequency it gets buffered into a divider by two so we get a 300 megahertz output uh, which then feeds this mixer and then comes back out on that coaxial cable then right the way back and then gets fed into the reference phase lock loop so because we're on this line here and uh, we can't see any pulses any steady DC voltage I think we've reached the uh, prognosis that the reference PLL uh, in the frequency counter module um, the uh, counter block has, uh, has failed and unfortunately it looks like as if that's the case so unless we can get spares obviously for that entire block well in the instrument um, that's you know one of those major modules in the uh, in the bottom of the instrument and it's quite an involved process replacing that if, if we had spares and unfortunately I don't have any spare parts I'm afraid for this particular spectrum analyzer because it's a model which is um, what they call the the low-cost spectrum analyzer these models and they have a different innards in them to um, to the other models of spectrum analyzers I have spares to the higher level spectrum analyzers higher models um, you know such as the 8560s uh, series which are I said the higher models they're a higher spec model uh, they're not the low cost spectrum analyzer they've got the trap gen on them they are the uh, totally different modules inside a lot more compact uh, you can tell those spectrum analyzers because when you pick them up they're a lot heavier to carry they weigh two three times as what this one does even though it's in the same casing so i have spares for the higher level model spectrum analyzers but not for the what's called the basic low cost spectrum analyzer which this particular model is um so yes it's unfortunate really 
that I think we've sort of hit the uh, the buffers uh, when it comes to um, you know dealing with the the fault um, naturally again a very similar methodology with this spectrum analyzer to what we had with the road and Swartz spectrum analyzer and road and Swartz test instruments where it, the repair methodology on these is to board level only or modular level uh, which is such a shame really because um, I feel that had we uh, or had diagrams we could have been able to do something to component level but again it's down to swapping boards cards so the third converter down here um, it will be a merely a case of replacing that as a whole module and uh, and obviously that would get it working again if that was faulty or you know the frequency counter box that are down there again you'd have to change those there's no component spares available for them you see apart from modules no diagrams no service information unfortunately so I think um, yeah, well, the other sign as well that I forgot to mention in the video somebody's already had a go at it because this this is a screw that goes into the um, digital board so somebody's had that out uh, at some point and left that flapping in the breeze I noticed that the, there's a T mark on the converter module that we we're looking at earlier um, just down at the back there it says T in that in that bottom corner the screws on the casing on the rear when I took it apart there was some of them missing and um, so somebody's had a go at it before somebody's done some kind of uh, you know quick diagnosis or whatever I'm not sure where but there's evidence that somebody's had a go at this before maybe not to the level we've done but certainly had a quick look or whatever because there's certain screws and things that's uh, that's you know that's loose so yeah it's such a shame isn't it really such a nice instrument as well but this is it you see with some of these uh, these instruments when you get them you never know what you're going to get you know when you buy them second hand or um, unless you can see them fully functioning and working uh, the gentleman who brought this to me is the same chap who brought the Roden and Swartz uh, FSE B30 7 gigahertz spectrum analyzer which I've done a video on and um, they've both suffered the same fate really whatever's happened to them um, either excessive input DC bias whatever or just you know natural component failure due to age but um, it's such a shame you know that uh, the sort of both damaged beyond repair due to uh, the spares availability situation and the the lack of service information regarding schematic diagrams it's just modular level you know and that's the repair methodology right from the start even in the Ulick Packard service manuals so yeah I'm I, I'm glad I've done what I've done because at least it shows that we have um, gone through all the steps in measuring all the signals through all the modules um, we've shown what signals are present and what frequency reference oscillator we've looked at the um, output signals of both 6 and 300 megahertz we tried to calibrate it we've gone through all the um, the DAC adjustment procedure we've circuit theorized and gone through all the um, functional description the really methodical fault finding processes that we've adhered to via the manual um, have all proven that yeah we've managed to fault find down to your modular level and uh, and within that we've managed to find that the phase lock loop control voltage isn't present uh, which comes obviously from the A25 counter module so I think we've sort of um, really well we can't progress any further put it that way I mean obviously without spares we'd need another one of these that same model range which is the um, 85 uh, 91 92 93 94 series spectrum analyzer which the service manual caters for we need another low cost HP Agilent 80 um, 590 series spectrum analyzer to be able to get the same parts out of it in order to uh, you know to um, to repair this sadly I don't have any spares for this you see so I'm, I'm useless without that so yeah it's such a shame really but there you go I mean these are knocking on for what probably these came out in the late 80s early 90s 
so they're, they're knocking on now these they've, they're quite old but uh, yeah such a shame really but uh, at least I've enjoyed going through showing the process of how we've looked at all the faults analyzed it and got down to the deeper level and ultimately we've proved now that the fault lay in the uh, counter module um, so unless we can get another one of those then we will not be able to progress the repair on this so I shall be contacting the gentleman concerned who bought who brought this to me and uh, let him know the news that it cannot be uh, repaired unfortunately due to lack of spares and um, obviously see what he wants to do about it from there anyway um, thank you very much for watching and uh, hope you've enjoyed the video and uh, I will see you again in the next one we've got plenty more repairs to do so there's all kinds of different uh, repairs I do like looking at pieces of equipment for people um, obviously there's a, a great deal of time that's needed to analyze these instruments it's not just a quick two minute job you know with the lid off test here test there you know there's a lot of investment in time put into looking at these faults and going through everything methodically and I have to be sure in myself as well when I've done these tests that when I hand the piece of equipment back uh, to the owner that you know I've done everything I can to try and you know get it going repair it and even if that means handing it back unrepaired at least I can say to the individual this is what modules faulty in it you know if you get another one of those then at least you've got some chance of being able to repair it and let them make the choice of what they want to do so with that thank you ever so much for watching and um, catch you in the next one bye for now